Seven things a man should know about himself. Seven things every man should know about himself. I want to give you these seven things. Seven is the scriptural number of completion. And uh, need some paper there? Uh, you got some? Okay, or a pen or anything? Someone got an extra pen? Who's got an extra pen? Anybody? Great, thanks. Jeremiah 4, 7 says, wisdom is the principal thing. And all you're getting, get wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom is the ability to see difference. The difference in people. The difference in a moment. The difference in an opportunity. The difference in your present season. Difference in yourself. And you must be able to discern the uniqueness of yourself. You must be able to discern things about yourself. Some things are similar, some things are not. One thing we know, every man is different. Even the male nature is not necessarily the same. Jeremiah 9, 23 talks about the importance of knowing God. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. Now I need the light on there. I need the light on there. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight. I have not seen an exception to that. There's teaching on radical grace that tends to diminish the expectation of God for obedience. And to believe that when we went from the Old Testament to the New Testament, God changed his expectations. He didn't. He changed his method in empowering us. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit visited in the New Testament, he stayed. In the Old Testament, we experienced the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, we're mentored by the Holy Spirit. God said, if you're going to glory in anything, glory that you know me. Then he continues and he talks about some incredible things that I think is very, very, very important for us. And if you turn over, turn to Romans four. Speaking of Abraham, verse 19, being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not. What a man. <laughs> he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. How many believe God can finish what he started in you? God can finish what he started in you. Number one, you should know the future that inspires you. You should know the future that inspires you. The present is for peace and contentment, but the future is for ecstasy exhilaration, enthusiasm, and energy. Remember, God operates in three worlds for the human. The past, which he uses as a history of triumphs and victories and successes. 
He uses the present for contentment, for peace, for ministry. And he has pictures of our future that unlock our energy, enthusiasm, our learning. All of our learning is for the future. We don't need it for the present because we're already here. But the learning today is for the future. And God starts making things many years before he starts using them. Some of the things you're building right now in your life have nothing to do with your present. They have to do with preparing for your future. So that when you enter the future and it becomes a present, you'll taste the rewards. You've sent them before you. What is the future that excites you? I remember looking at a list just a few days ago, and uh, I guess we accept about one out of 100 open doors that come to our ministry. I preach for churches rarely anymore, and we work with television, books, and conferences. And I was looking down the list of all the invitations, um, remarkable invitations. And I remember when I was 20 or 21, I would have thought, I was in Canaan to look at all the open doors that God had opened. I would think I had made it beyond. And I'm sitting there not wanting to leave my house, but also embracing opportunity and knowing that the anointing of God was on us to go, go in all the world, preach the gospel. Obedience is not always easy. Obedience is not always restful. Obedience is not always a preference. My rejuvenated or regenerated nature hasn't made me able to obey easily. Sometimes there's still things I don't want to do, things I don't want to, places I don't want to go. But I was thinking, I remember when success was having an open door. But life has sure changed. My future now that I picture is quite different. I want a future where I write and I think. And I don't want a future hopping on airplanes and flying around the world. My future is different, and it has a different excitement. And you, you must sculpture an awareness of how, what's the future that excites you? What excites you may not excite the one next to you. You must know that about yourself. You must know the future that God is evolving, and God is giving you a taste for. And signs are always stationed way before the turnoff. What's the picture you have of your future? Have you, are you developing it? Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. Your imagination was given to you to picture change and to picture the future, pre-play your future. Your memory is for history, storing events, storing uh, knowledge, storage of ex experiences. That's the purpose of your memory. But you have a future. God works with their future. Your future cures today and cures the pain of today and the cure of the past. Very, very important that you understand the power of a picture of the future. It's what kept Michael Phelps swimming and pushing and going in the Olympics. Hope is energizing. And it actually affects the present. Most of our joy that we're walking in today has to do with the future. Most of the energy and the excitement. And after you complete a goal, there's a great emptiness. You'll notice that after you have done anything significant, after there's always been an emptying, at every completion, there's an explosion of exhilaration and then a great vacuum. Because that vacuum has been created because now you must capture a new future. Before you completed something, that was your future. When you arrived at it, you ended it, there was a joy, there was a victory, and then there was an emptiness. And usually it'll last maybe um, anywhere from one to seven days, and there'll be a great emptiness, and you have to go back and stir something up about your future. What am I going to do now? You should know the future that, it, that, that excites you so much that you pour excellence into your present moment. I consider now to be the seed for next.
Now is always the seed for next. Today is the seed for tomorrow. And the picture you have of tomorrow really decides your conduct today. If you know that Canaan is close, it decides how you leave Egypt. Number two, you should know the hidden treasures God stored in you from your birth. You should know the hidden treasures, the giftings, the guilt, the skills, the perceptions, the intuition, all your uniqueness. What do you love? What do you love to think about? What do you hate? What do you, what, what do you want to change? You should know your dominant difference from other men. Are you good with numbers? Are you self-motivated? Are you always consistently cheerful? Are you analytical? Are you good with carpentry? Are you good with your hands? Are you good at research? Are you extraordinary in motivating a group of people toward one goal? Are you productive when you're alone? You must know the hidden treasure stored inside of you, and you must search for that. You do it through self-interrogation. One of the ways you can know What's in you is the open doors that have come before you. What kind of opportunities has God given you? Who are the people that respond to you? What are the problems you enjoy solving? What do you hate to quit doing every day? You must know the environment that inspires you. You must know what you need. You must identify emerging needs and different needs. Your needs today will be different than next month and next year. Your needs will change. What do you consider your greatest difference in treasure from God? Very, very important. Three, what do you consider your greatest weakness? How would your enemy choose to destroy you? If you fall, if you fall privately or publicly, what do you consider your weakness and what are you going to do about it? I went through a troubling experience, and these are troubling times. It's troubling when the news is obsessed about a girl that had eight children, but they're not obsessed over doctors who killed a million babies. That's troubling. That's, that, that's troubling. It's troubling when Congress wants to study the eight greatest preachers in our generation because they fly planes, but they're willing to pass $800 billion bill and never read a page of the 700 report to know how it's going to be spent. We have got insanity in our Congress, and I couldn't tell you one who has a brain. Couldn't tell you one. May be there, but I couldn't tell you. It's troubling. It's troubling to watch the insane spend the money of our grandchildren, and we do not have one single finger to move against it. It's troubling. It's troubling when we, there's a fight to get something done today that we're not going to see change for two years. And the $800 billion will give every one of us a dollar and fifty cents a day increase. I still say most of the insane are not yet committed. But then we're the followers. So who's the insane? The leader that goes off the cliff or we who are following him off the cliff? It's troubling. It's troubling when a preacher that built a lifetime helping people poured his life out, a phenomenal man of God, but he had a weakness he couldn't conquer. It was exposed, so the entire Christian church and Christian entity has destroyed him. I thought the gospel was about restoration. I thought that's the purpose of the blood. If you're perfected, there's no need for the cross. Let he that hath no sin cast the first stone. 
I don't understand another man's sin, but I sure know what weakness is. I got a little devil in me. I got two or three little devils, and I have new devils that I meet once in a while that I never met before. How many's got a little devil in you? How many's trying to keep him caged? Oh, yeah. Do you know your weakness? What are you willing to do about it? How will you dismantle it? How will you turn that mountain into a pebble? How will you harness the wildness in you? How will you keep it under the blood? And where you feel strong today, you may not feel strong next month. Every man has a weakness. Michael Jordan can't swim, but he sure loves casinos. What are you going to do about your weakness? Deny it or bring it to the blood? I think you bring it to the blood. Submit it to the power of the Holy Ghost. I believe that here is, there is the capacity to overcome. Who will you trust with your weakness? Who will you trust? You're going to have to trust somebody because two are better than one. You're going to have to have an intercessor that prays. I'll never forget a friend of mine had a, in Bible college had a fr uh, problem with homosexuality. Fabulous person, a good man, brilliant musician, good preacher, excellent preacher. Got married to a beautiful girl. And he would tell me sometimes that when I'm driving around, he said, this thing will hit me and come on me so strong. He said, I'll call my wife and say, baby, you got to pray. I thought, how could she live with that? She did. He died with AIDS. A phenomenal man of God. Loved God. Loved the presence of God. Could get you into God's presence so fast. But he didn't find the intercessors he needed to walk with him through his weakness. In Scripture, great men are not always wise, as Job said. All men fall. The great ones get back up. Not the same sin. And I don't think every sin has the same impact, obviously. But it's important for you to know your struggle. Four, what would you like to change about yourself? What would you like to change about yourself? Who has had the same problem you've had? And what have they done about it? I'm fascinated by people who lose weight especially these who lose 80 pounds like in three days. I'm a sucker. Don, I'm a sucker for guys who can lose weight so fast. I love to see guys with these six-pack waist. Aren't that, isn't that fascinating? Ripples. What am I willing to change about myself? That's something else. What are you willing to change about yourself? Is the change, is the rewards of the change worth the investment of your time and energy? All things, old things pass away, become, all things become new. What would you like to change about your health? What do you need to change? What are you willing to change? You should really know about yourself at least three things that you would like to improve. Someone said you can go, get it, go anywhere you want to in life as long as you're willing to take enough small steps. Small steps create great changes. Little acorns create great oak trees. What would you like to change about you? And how do you propose to do it? How do you propose to do it? You say, well, I'd like to change... Um, the way I approach my children, I'd like to change the way I uh, communicate with my wife. I'd like to change me. I, I, don't wanna, I don't dialogue enough, and I don't know how to open up. Well, you can learn. You can really learn. Your personality is basic. It was created by the Holy Spirit, not your mother or father. Personality was intended for your, for your assignment. But there's tweaking and there's developing. And um, you can learn the art of listening well. There's things you can become. There's things you can become. What would you like to change most? What would you love to change about you? I was very hurt 
when a uh, my lower teeth were separated pretty wide. Almost you could see a, a missing tooth there. Now, the Maasai children love that in Kenya. I would go up into the northern frontier, <laughs> you know, Kakamega, Kasumu, and uh, Navasha, all those. And the little Maasai children would come up in the tribe, the villages, and all, oh, especially the women. The Maasai women liked me. Paul, they liked me. I may have missed God's will there. I may have missed God's will. I would come up, and they had some knockout women in those Maasai village with all those things around their neck, and they and they would point to me, and they would point to my teeth, my missing tooth, because they in their tribe they'd pull out a tooth. So when I walked in, started smiling, my my missing tooth was there, and boy, I tell you, I can still see. Ah, I was one of I was one of them. They saw that missing tooth. Little kids would come up and say, you got a tooth miss missing. And I, it was embarrassing. And a preacher friend of mine and his wife said, you know, you're so precise about everything. You love excellence. Why don't you do something about that missing tooth? I said, it's not a missing tooth. The muscle's grown up. They didn't know I'd spent many trips to dentists trying to find someone who would be willing to work with it, but nobody would. It embarrassed me. And they said, you need to change that. You need to. And I was just, I was mad, you know, just. I want to think just as I am, you know, just God accepts me the way I am. But I, uh, I was hurt. Oh, I was hurt. But I found a dentist to straighten it out and, and make a change. And, and when it was all costly, and pride mostly, and some money. Uh, and I had to take some steps. Whatever it is you want to change about you, whether it's physical, emotional, or financial, or anything you want to change, you can change. Five, who are the encouragers in your circle? Who are your encouragers? Who are your encouragers? Who are the people? Not the people that want to encourage you. Not the people that do. But who are the people that can? There's a real difference between people who love you and even people who encourage you and people who can encourage you. Yesterday, I listened to an old message that was several weeks old from my sister Deborah, and she was almost in tears. She almost really was. She had just read my book on healing, and she says, I cannot wait till you can pour yourself into the book. She says, no one can write what you're writing. And I listened to her message. It was one I had stored. I had loved it so much I had stored but never gone back. And it's probably several months old, several months old, probably three or four months old. And I got so stirred up just hearing her message. Now, other people can say things, but there's, there are people that just have the ability, don't they? Just, they, they unlock something. How many have someone in your life that one sentence from them is worth a hundred from anyone else? Identify those people who for some strange, remarkable reason have a spirit-to-spirit -spirit effect on your spirit. Who are the people who unlock your energy? Who are the people that make you rise up? Something rises up in you to take on life and embrace life. You must identify who are the people who are strangely connected to your spirit. It's a spirit-to-spirit -spirit thing. There's people who come up to me and can tell me things. I say, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. And it goes in one and out the other, really. But boy, there's someone who says, well, you, what you said changed me forever. Boy, that, and that does something to you. Six, what false perception, teaching, or philosophy has developed in you from your childhood? What false perception, teaching, or philosophy has developed in you from your childhood. Many are taught against the Holy Spirit, taught against healing. Some were some of us have been taught to live off the government, that somebody's supposed to take care of us and pay our bills. Some of us have a welfare mentality that everybody owes us something. Some of us have been taught that the family doesn't matter, that working is more important. Some of us have been taught to borrow money and, and go into debt for everything we have. We all have different backgrounds. I was never taught the importance of money. That never entered, never entered my philosophy. In fact, I was taught that that was materialistic, that you should never. Actually, I grew up in an environment that, that, if, God, that if you just loved God, uh, the money would be there enough. I didn't understand anything about laws that created increase. I didn't, no one told me that God didn't decide if I had money, that my obedience to a divine law decided the flow of money. 
What false, erroneous philosophy are you carrying around right now inside of you? Because you can carry a lie for your entire life. There's people who die without ever experiencing Christ. There's people who die without ever believing in divine healing. Will you die with error embedded in your philosophy? Find it. Look for it. Ask God to expose it. There's probably not a week goes by that I don't ask God to expose any lie that subconsciously has entered my spirit. Lie about people. Lie about change. Seven, what persuasions deep within you are really scriptural, accurate, and have proved in your life experience? What persuasions deep within you are scriptural, accurate, and have proved to be true in your life experience? My persuasion that the presence of of Whatever your persuasions are, you're living. I do not believe there's an option to the word of God. I have a persuasion that everything I need to know to succeed is hidden in the word of God. Somehow, some way. I'll ask you another question. What standards have you set for others to become your friend? Friendliness is different than friendship. Have you set any standards for intimacy with you? Have you set any standards? Can anybody walk in your life? Can anybody walk in your home? Can anybody walk into your thinking? You really need to know what you require. What kind of standards have you set for yourself? Take the hands of someone right next to you and right there at your home, I want you to join us. Say this with me aloud. Father, I thank you that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Today, I will be Everything you want me to be. Amen. Amen. I never tire of the wisdom of God. Wisdom is the ability to recognize difference. Right and wrong. Evil and righteousness. Difference in people. Difference in a countenance. Difference in a moment like the blind man crying out to Jesus. The dominant purpose for wisdom, and don't you love the wisdom of God? So thankful you're listening today and watching and being a part of the internet, telling others about it. And I hope you're getting, by the way, I hope you're getting my daily podcast every single day on your iPod or your MP3, every single day, two minutes of wisdom. Be a blessing. Sometimes I go a little over because I get excited. I want you to be a part of this ministry. I believe that when you get involved with God, he gets involved with you. I am one of the ministers of the gospel who believe the words of Jesus. I believe every word he said. When he told Peter that there would be a hundredfold return on any investment in the gospel, in Mark 10, 28 through 30, I believed him. When the word of God says in Malachi 3, that if I bring the tithe, which is 10% of my income, and the offering back to him, that he would open the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing I don't have room enough to receive, I believe him. Why would I believe God about heaven and hell and not believe him about the blessing of the Lord? I want to pray over the seeds that you have been planting in this ministry. And by the way, I have an incredible gift you're going to love. In fact, it's probably one of the greatest gifts I've ever offered. We're asking the Holy Spirit for 300 partners this week who will set aside a seed of $300 for our outreaches. I need your help. I want you to help me. Not just to feed a thousand children a day, which we do, or a thousand families, or underwrite the wisdom of Asia Bible College, or to underwrite the tent factory in South Africa, or the home of hope, but that we can go into 100 countries with the gospel. I'm holding in my hand the wisdom quick scan Bible. The wisdom quick scan Bible. I have never in my life found a Bible easier to read. As you know, for many years, I've read the Bible through 40 chapters a day, every single month of my life. When I found out that I could offer it to you inside of some of the teaching that I've been doing and I'll do today, I want you to have it. Call me right now, plant your seed of 300 and watch God move.